my name is Tom and uh, I'm going to be uh, doing a little talk today on entrepreneurship. Uh, Tom or Thomas Locke speaking. Yeah, so let's dive straight in. Let's dive straight in. Um, so I graduated from the University of Lincoln in 2019. Uh, here's a bit. Oh, sorry, I had my YouTube video up then it was playing myself, right? Yeah, so I graduated from the University of Lincoln in 2019. Here's me looking looking very, very nice just before graduation. And uh, during my time at university, thank you for the hype, Joey. <laughs> during my time at university, uh, I ran the Games Development Society in my third year. And uh, here's a lovely picture of uh, me and the two guys that I ran it with. I think this was about 2 a.m. Uh, and yeah, it was a nice thing. I, I like doing those, 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 um, those game jams. So these days after university, I run two companies. One is an app development firm called Fresh Play and another is a game development firm called Leuven Interactive. Um, yeah, so Fresh Play focuses mainly on, like I say, it's an app development firm. It focuses mainly on producing client work. So we get a message or we get an email, we quote a price, uh, half of that invoice gets paid, we start work and then there's kind of a back and forth with the client and then we help them push it out to release. Uh, this is an example of an app that we actually made. We've only ever released one project that we did ourselves called 75 Habit. And Leuven Interactive is responsible for the development of a game called BrewQuest, which is a 2D MMO, which is releasing on Steam in February. Uh, some of you might know that um, I worked on, some of you, if you knew me at university or if you've known me at any point in the last four years, might know that BrewQuest has been a long running thing for me. And it's only recently that we've been able to actually pull the time and funds together to actually get it get it working and this is a complete rewrite of that game so there's kind of a couple of a couple of joined interests there so if you're if, if all of the, obviously these talks are, are mainly focused for the school of computer science um i'm not going to go into any technical details during this talk but you kind of get an idea that my background is in computer science and that the things that my companies do is all about software all about software i also don't look at the reviews for 75 habit they're super mean uh, and there's a couple of things we need to fix, but uh, <laughs> some of them are nice. So yeah, I, I'm going to be giving some, essentially some anecdotes about running the company. So I've been running this company, my, my company Fresh Play and recently Leuven for uh, just over two years now. And a lot of the things that I have to say about it, I think won't be your traditional uh, kind of A to B business sort of things. I think a lot of people, when they talk about business, they have a habit of saying, I did this, then I did this, and you can do that too. And the fact is that business isn't really like that outside of, say, Instagram ads or, or YouTube ads. Um, so I want to just give some anecdotes, some general anecdotes, and then kind of explain the lessons that I learned during that. If, if at any time anyone wants to ask a question or say anything, feel free to just put it in the YouTube comments and we'll be able to flag it up and, and I'll answer that once I finish speaking. So we'll start off with some myths about running a business. Uh, I, have some, I have some green tea here. So sit before we get before we get into that. So a couple of myths about running a business. I think there's there's this this big idea that running a business is like being on a permanent vacation. I think this is made worse by a lot of things in media and talking about Instagram ads and kind of entrepreneurs and, and people that whose business it is uh, to essentially sell courses explaining how to be a businessman. But the reality isn't quite the same as uh, as what those those ideas kind of put across. And some of the main myths and things that I believe when I first started my business was that one, you can set your own hours, which means if you just want to work two hours a day, you only need to work two hours a day. Wonderful. Another one is that you will earn loads of money, loads of money, loads and loads of money. And uh, number three is that you get to be the boss. Everyone wants to be the boss, wants to have some degree of power and um, be in charge of things, telling people what to do. But if we look at the reality of those three things, it's, it's not quite the same. Um, in terms of setting your own hours, yes, you could very easily work two hours a week. And that sounds wonderful. But when you consider the fact that when you run a business, the output is directly related to, to your input, it doesn't really work like that. You don't have a job. You have a 24-7 lifestyle. If an email comes through on a Sunday, a Sunday evening, you might think it's a Sunday evening. I'm not going to reply to that email. But you've seen it. And now the cogs are turning and it, it's in your head. And even if you only reply to it on Monday morning after 9 a.m., that's what I like to do. Ignore all emails over the weekend, get back to them on a, on a Monday morning. It's still in your head. It's still there. And 
The thing about that is that that sounds like a nightmare, like being permanently at your job. But if you're the kind of driven person that wants to be a businessman or, or wants to run a business, then chances are you already got that mindset of working 24 um, seven. One of the things on ProQuest, one of the big features that we added recently in the last week actually was um, the ability to talk to NPCs and get different dialogue options. So you go and say hello, say for example, to the bartender and the bartender is like, ah, how are you doing? What, 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 can, I, what can I do for you? Uh, and the options are grab a pint, you know, uh, have some food or, or do you have any, have any jobs? Um, that was coded entirely on a Sunday morning because I was out on a run the night before and the idea hit me and I couldn't get it out of my head. I couldn't wait for Monday. So I spent four or five hours that morning on my laptop coding that up. Uh, and the rest of the week, we actually had less progress than that. So you see, you kind of get this idea of, uh, you know, you're setting your own hours, but your hours are actually constant. Um, earning loads of money. No. <laughs> Business is extremely is extremely hard work. And the fact of the matter is that for the first year, perhaps even for the first two years, unless you're very, very lucky, you're not going to be rolling in it. It's it's not it's not one of these things that you could just start and then immediately be successful in. Success doesn't look like lining your pockets. It looks like earning enough, figuring out how much you need to earn for that period, and then increasing your team size so that you can then earn more in the future. That's kind of the focus of it. So you don't earn as much money, but it's all about expansion. And another thing about that is that although obviously the aim of business is to make money and to make a profit, in reality, a lot of, a lot of the time, especially in your first and second year, what you're earning is contacts and experience. And that is in some ways more important than money at that stage. And finally, being the boss is not, is not a position of power. I'm going to go into this a little bit more later. Um, I can see in the chat, someone from my team is here, Dan. Hi, Dan. Um, it, it, being the boss isn't what everyone thinks it is. Uh, and I'm going to talk a little bit more about that later. So I won't, I won't fix out on that too much now. So how do we get to that point? How do we get to that point? Um, and I think if, if you're watching this, then chances are you're interested in business. And I think you need to first differentiate. Now, this isn't a technical term. What I'm about to say is not technical. I made it up. I made it up on my laptop yesterday, but it's an important distinction for me. Um, are you business first or are you business second? Yes, boss. <laughs> so here's what I mean by that. Someone who is business first is interested in business. They're interested in running a business. This might be someone who is interested in being an investor or in running multiple companies. Um, and the path forward for those people is to pick a niche and find a way of successfully monetizing it. Now, someone who I would say is business second is someone who is interested in product or in a specific product, the path path forward for that person is to just keep making that thing. Uh, the reason I word it like that is because, you know, is the business the most important thing or is making the thing the most important thing? And both of these, both of these are completely valid. If you're a business first person and you're interested in running a business, then that's great. If you're interested in making things on your own terms, that's also great. I think, especially in the School of Computer Science, a lot of people are probably going to be business second, where they've got this great idea for a game or great piece of software they've been working on. They're super excited about, uh, but you know they're not particularly interested in the running of the business. And that was me with BroadQuest in my first and second year. Um, and here's, here's kind of what I mean. So I run two companies, like I've already said, Freshplay and Lubin. Freshplay was originally set up to sell BroadQuest. Now, Leuven is Broquest is now owned by Leuven. And that's because Fresh Play very, very quickly became a business first business. It was all about making the money so that I could pay my wages. And again, I'm going to go into this in a little bit more detail and tell you the exact path that I took later on. But it's it's kind of nice to go from wanting to focus on a product, the business second thing, as I say, to uh, going back to business first, kind of losing sight of that product and finally being able to go back to uh, to working on that product, which is what Leuven is right now. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to go into those points a little bit deeper. And one of the main things I'm going to do in this talk is not tell you exactly, like I've already said, is not tell you exactly how to uh, be successful in business, but the things that have helped me. And this is a huge deal for me. This above all else for me is hugely important. And it's about surrounding yourself with people who are driven. What do I mean by this? Well, you need to you need to assess if you're thinking of starting a business or if you've if you work if you already are in business, um, you need to assess the people that are around you. Can you, for example, talk to your friends about your business or product? Are they supportive or do they break you down? 
if they break you down, the fact of the matter is, is that it's never about you. It's about them. And it can be really tough to leave that negative feedback loop. If every single time you show someone something that you're working on, they go, that's rubbish. That's not very good. Here are the reasons why that's terrible. And there's a difference there between constructive criticism, that's being supportive, and just straight up rejecting it. Um, someone once said to me, um, I literally hate everything that you do. That was a friend of mine. We're, we're still friends. It's, it's important to put that across. What they were saying is kind of in a teasing, mocking way. I don't like this thing. And that's absolutely fine. And that's a perfectly valid opinion. But when it comes to being, when you're excited about a product, you're excited about your business and you want to be showing it off to people and people to say, oh, that's really great. Here's a couple of things. You consider doing this, consider doing this. That's what you want. And I guarantee you from my own experience, if you surround yourself with people who are driven, people who are positive, people who aren't going to be jealous of your success, but help you along with it, then that is absolutely life-changing. Now, when I say you should assess your, your closest circle, that isn't to say that you should outright reject people that aren't in that space. But it's important to, to have a degree of separation there. In the case of that friend I was talking about before who said something particularly nasty about something I was working on, he didn't mean it in a nasty way necessarily. It, again, it was mocking or teasing. And then we were a lot younger. I'm still friends with that person. But when it comes to business, I don't talk to them about it. I don't show them things that I'm working on. What they see from the outside is me working on stuff and me iteratively getting better and better at the things that I do. Uh, and you know, they, they, there's a lot more respect there. But you need to figure out who you share your ideas with and who you don't share your ideas with. If there is someone that you know keeps giving you negative feelings towards something that you're showing, then, then don't show it to that person. Find, find your crowd. You have to find your crowd. Um, so I want to talk also a little bit about following on from that about mental health and business, because that can really, really get you down. Um, it, it's difficult to talk about mental health in the context of business, because in my mind, business isn't quantifiable to human experience, because business isn't based in human, human happiness. It's based on constant improvement and constant uh, increase in things like profits or increase in capacity or increase in productivity. And the fact of the matter is, is that sometimes you can't just will yourself to work under pressure. Take a sip. <laughs> when you're in a negative feedback loop and you know, you're trying really, really hard at something and every single time you, you know, show a little bit of yourself, uh, you're a little bit vulnerable about, vulnerable about that thing. You're opening yourself up to that kind of criticism. And I think that's true at every stage of business. Let's take Fresh Play, for example, where we're working almost exclusively on apps for other customers. When we show it to that client, there's a vulnerability there because you know we've, we've worked our hardest over the last couple of months to get this thing together. And we know, because this is, this is just the way that it works when you're doing, when you're doing work for customers, that there are going to be things they don't like. And people tend to focus on the things that they don't like over the things that they really, really like. You may never even get that thank you for all of the things, that, all the little tiny details you've added in, all the little animations and things in the example of an app. And that can get you down. And there's an, there's an immense pressure, especially when it, in my case, so my company, Fresh Play, there are four employees, including myself. My primary source of income is based on how productive I am in a week. And... The primary source of income for those four people, I'm just include myself in it, for those four people is also dependent on how well I manage the team, how productive I am in my jobs and how productive everyone else is in their jobs. And that's an immense amount of pressure because you know that if you drop the ball, then it's not just you that has to face the consequences. It's other people around you and their families. And that can really, really bring you down again. I'm trying to think, is there anything else? Are there any other examples I've got? When I, I was talking earlier about work hours, and when I say you know you're you're a twenty four seven businessman in the end, it's true. And yeah, getting that email on a Sunday, it's not just a case of oh I'm going to reply to it. Oh, it's really good. I'm I'm working so hard. I'm working uh, nine a.m. to three a.m. That's not positive. That's not good for your mental health. But sometimes it's something that you have to do. And again, these are all things that you need to balance and all things that you need to weigh up. And in my case, um, it, it's been hugely important and hugely beneficial to me to establish a non-business routine uh, and try and come up with a list of things that you can do that are completely unrelated to your business uh, and completely independent of your business. If your business fails, you can still have these things. Now, for me, that's taken the form of running 
music and football. Um, those are just examples. Oh, that is a lovely picture of my face right there, isn't it? Wow, absolutely wonderful. I'm glad. I'm glad that I, I looked at these pictures. <laughs> it doesn't have to be exercise. It doesn't have to be anything like that. But when you monetize your hobby, it stops feeling like a hobby. So you need to make sure you have other hobbies that you can fall back on if things go south or things get really, really tough. And you're a human being. Things will get really, really tough. That is the nature of business. And it could be really, really difficult to keep your head above the waters in that situation. But I really think that having having a strong routine with hobbies is is, is a great way of, of minimizing that and having other stuff you can fall back on uh, when your business is causing you such a huge amount of anxiety. So we're going to move away from all that and talk about something more businessy. I imagine if you're watching this, then you may already run a business or you may be thinking about running a business. I'm assuming a lot of people that will be watching this on the replay will be students. And the best time to start a business is a really tough thing to think about. And the time frame of a business is a really tough thing to think about. And for me, it was all dependent on my priorities. Uh, when I left Lincoln back in June of 2019, uh, I came back, I moved in with my parents. Uh, and I realized that uh, my fiance had another year at university. So that was my time frame. I had 12 months to create myself, create for myself a full time paying job. And if that failed, then I would need to get a regular job. And that was that was a year of my life where I knew that my actions would directly affect the trajectory of the rest of my life. And, you know, in, in business, uh, it, it's, it never gets as serious as that. It never gets as serious as when you first start your business. And it's the thing that you need to think about. So for me, I had a year. Uh, I had a year and I had a game that, you know, had been delayed for three times, for three years in total. There was nowhere near release, and, and I'm reviewing the code. You can see in the uh, the thing here of my iMac, the background is actually one of the BrawlQuest uh, adverts that we created or that I created. At the time, it was only me. I had no team yet. It was just me on my own. And I looked at the, the code base of BrawlQuest, and I realized that this is going to need a complete rewrite. So that wasn't the path to go down. Uh, I've been doing app development at a previous job where I helped some friends run a company. And so I decided to do almost the exact same thing we were doing there, which was uh, trying to get clients falling back on a platform called Fiverr uh, in order to make money off of apps. I just realized the next screen is BrawlQuest and then a big crossover. I'm, I mean, this is this is new BrawlQuest. This is our beautiful new uh, login screen that um, Dan, who was in chat right there, has been working on. Um, so let's just pretend this is an old screenshot and then that we've got the big crossover the old screenshot rather than the big crossover the new screenshot. <laughs> But um, yeah, so in my first year, these are all pictures from my first year. Uh, originally, I had it up here, but there wasn't much space. So my parents very graciously let me move the uh, the iMac back down onto our dining table in the living room. And uh, this is our cat, Tilly, uh, who used to, used to hang out with me while I was working. In my first two months of working on Fiverr, I probably worked harder than I ever have anything in my entire life and probably ever will work out in anything in my entire life. I must have spent in those two months around 150 to 200 hours working. And in that time, I made about 700 pounds. That might sound like a lot. It's not for that amount of work. That, that's a phenomenally small amount of money for that amount of work. But when you first start off in business, it's all about building up your contacts and proving yourself. At the time, you know, my Fiverr profile, as an example, I had no reviews. So I needed to build that up, get a bunch of five-star reviews, get a bunch of orders under my belt before I could really go anywhere with it. One year later, uh, we'd made over 65,000 pounds on the platform. So that so that goes to show, you know, that there is money in that. But you, you, the first couple of months, you're not going to see very much uh, back from the amount of work you put in. And I think that's not just true from a you know, business to customer relationship, but any any business, whether you're selling a product or whether you're doing consulting, anything like that, you need to bear in mind the fact that you're gonna, first you're gonna put in a lot more work than you're gonna really see any benefit from. And by the way, Fiverr is a terrible platform. Do not, do not start using Fiverr. It's, it's, if you're a university and you want a taste of business, 
go make a Fiverr profile. If you want to start a business, Fiverr is a good way of earning earning a decent amount of money fairly fast, but it will destroy your life. And uh, <laughs> okay, maybe that's a little bit too dramatic. Fiverr is 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 a fine platform, uh, but it has a lot of problems and it's not very seller focused. So I really wouldn't recommend it. That just happens to be the path that I went down. The thing is, your commitments will determine your first year of business, but it doesn't need to determine your second or third. Your first year of business really is a springboard to the things that come next. So when I talk about the first couple of months doing a phenomenal amount of work for very little in return, that's not the case anymore. And it was only because of those two months, because of the platform that I just said was rubbish, that I'm able to do what I'm able to do now, which is work on Broadcast full time, which is basically a dream come true. Um, we don't know how well the game's going to do. Uh, we don't know. We've got six months of, of, of a kind of runway ahead of us where, you know, if it doesn't work after six months, we're going to have to go back to doing client work and kind of leave that dream behind a little bit. But for the moment, it feels really, really good to be working on a game full time after spending an entire year being immensely stressed. And anyone that knows me will tell you I was immensely stressed over the last last year, last year and a half. It's been brilliant and chaotic and horrendous. That doesn't sound like I'm selling it very well. What I'm saying now is that it's worth it. Uh, you don't have very much control over the way your first year of business looks in terms, it will be stressful, you will need to work hard, but that doesn't necessarily mean that your second or third year of business will be as hard as that or look anywhere near the same as that. So my main piece of advice, you know, there's, there's two bits of advice there that I've said so far to anyone that is looking at starting a business is, um, Surround yourself with driven people that are going to push you along and, and, and really hype you up and make you excited for the thing that you're working on, but also to figure out your commitments and plan accordingly, plan your business accordingly, plan your time frame accordingly. Uh, if we go back to that business first or business second idea I came up with earlier, um, I'm definitely business second, but I had to put that aside for a year and a half and go completely business first, focusing on money, focusing on deadlines, focusing on profits in order to reach a point where I was able to switch to being business second. Oh yeah, is a good one. <laughs> Don't need to say too much about that. Uh, I got a 2-1 at university. I could have got a first, but at the time in my mind, business was much more important. Um, my dissertation supervisor was um, Chris Hedlund, and he did a very, very good job of trying to convince me to focus on university and focus on my dissertation. Uh, but I didn't do that because I was very naive and silly and thought university doesn't doesn't matter as much. Like if you're a student, you're in such a great if you're a student, sorry, and you're and you're economically, you're OK at the minute. You're doing OK. You're in such a great position to start a business without having to worry. You know, let's say you're in first year where you've got three years ahead of you where not only are you going to learn so much and mix with so many other people. But if things don't work out in the first couple of years, you don't need to worry too much about it. You can pick yourself up. You can start something else. Um, if you're in second year, again, you've got those two years. Even if you're in third year, that's when I started my business. But university comes first. Please, please. If, you, if you're a university student and you decide to start a business, that's fantastic. That's great. But university has to come first. <laughs> Let's talk about building a team. Uh, this, this is maybe a little bit, a little bit further in scope than uh, maybe the people watching this would would the level they're at right now thinking about you know at the minute you might be thinking oh, i don't even know how to start a business I, I'm, I'm looking at starting a business how do i get to a point where i'm building a team well one of the things i mentioned earlier is that in your first year uh, just because you might earn a lot of money in your first year the company might earn a lot of money doesn't necessarily mean it's a good idea to book it up for yourself i chose in my first year of business to almost immediately hire one of my friends um, he's not someone I'd worked with before on very much, uh, but he is someone that I knew from college and I'd stayed friends with whilst we were both at university who I knew was a fantastic programmer. And uh, he had a job essentially working retail and I thought that's not right. And I said to him, look, here's the situation. Do you want to come and work for me? Here's what you'll be doing. You'll be doing apps. I cannot pay you anywhere near as much as the work you're doing and the level of work you're doing. Uh, but I can guarantee you that if you stick, if you stick with me for a longer period of time, that will increase. Um, and, you know, big props to him. He you know, decided to go along with it. And uh, in that first in that first year, there are a couple of situations where I had to give some of my money to the company in order to pay wages. 
Uh, there were times when I wouldn't get paid and he would get paid. But if it wasn't for him joining the company when he did, we wouldn't have reached the point later down the line where you know we were starting to get a little bit more comfortable with the amount of money we were earning. So I decided, let's hire some more people. Let's change what we're doing a little bit. Um, and then two more people joined, both of them focused on design, uh, both very, very different approaches to their work. One of them is now doing a lot of the UI development on RuleQuest and is doing an absolutely fantastic job. The other one initially came to me and said, hey, um, can I do these things? Can I, can I do things with um, with you, with your company? And I wasn't really sure. And to be honest with you, and um, I think they might be aware of this if they're watching now. Uh, I essentially said to them, right, well, let's come up with some app designs and you know, we'll, we'll, see, we'll see how things go over time. Uh, and I really wasn't sure. And I think I kind of strung them along for the first couple of months thinking, there's no way, there's no way the designs you're sending aren't that great. Um, there's no way. I, I, to be clear, I wasn't doing... Um, sorry, <laughs> thank you for zooming me in then. To be clear, I wasn't giving them work. I wasn't making any money off of what they were saying. I was just saying, you need to train, you need to learn more about UI design. Six months later, I am continually astounded by the level of quality that that person produces. And... I almost said to them, you know what, this isn't going to work. You, you, you're not producing the things. But because I decided to leave it a little bit, um, there's now a fantastic, they're a fantastic addition to the team. And it's the same with the first designer, the first designer that joined. There were a couple of designs that were a little bit dodgy, but but mostly there. Um, we actually built a couple apps based off, based off of those designs. Clients were happy enough. But then we found over time that their real good quality was in user interaction design rather than user interface design. And then further down the line to help out on BrawlQuest and, and really work hard at that. And now their contributions to BrawlQuest and every single day coming up with new ideas and new challenges for me, making the game considerably better, significantly better than what it would have been. And that's four people. That's four people. There's me and I'm me. <laughs> I'm doing what I can. I'm working as hard as I possibly can, but it, it can be hard to stay afloat sometimes because my passion is really for making stuff, not for the business side of things. Uh, we have a developer who is really more than happy to be doing client work. I don't find it particularly fulfilling, but I know for a fact that I can give them a piece of work to do and they will get it done. Uh, a user interaction designer who has recently been learning coding and helping out on the game and a UI designer. And one of the key things here is that it's important to get this right and to find balance. When you make your first hire at a business, from my experience, every single time I've hired someone, and I'm sorry because I know they're watching, I have been disappointed almost immediately. It's hard to find a balance. But over time, you realize the individual unique qualities of each person and what they bring to the table unique from you. When I hired my first developer, I was expecting them to be exactly like me, have the exact same eye for detail, have the exact same coding style. And the fact of the matter is that they didn't. They were interested in different things. Um, the things that they excel in are things that I fall short in. And it's easy to get frustrated when you hire someone expecting them to fulfill a certain function to make your life easier, and they don't quite do it the way that you would want them to do it. But I think it's absolutely essential to allow them that space to, to learn and to grow within that position and within your business. Wow, I spoke about that for a lot longer than I anticipated, sorry. I just think it's a really important point and to set your expectations at a level to not set you up for failure or further frustration or an extreme amount of stress because that was me in the early days when I had my, I had my first hire, he was doing a great job, he was doing all of his projects very well, but because it wasn't exactly the way that I would do things, I found myself getting really frustrated. Uh, patience and allowing people room to grow is so important. And respecting your team is crucial to all of that. One of the things, I don't expect a lot of people that are interested in business to be something that they, uh, this to be something that they would do. But one of the things that's hugely important to me personally is letting my team members know, here's a price, piece of client work you're working on. Here's the amount they're paying. Here's the amount you're getting paid. Let's talk about where that profit's going. You need to respect your team. And I think there's a big differentiation here. I think it's a very modern mindset. You aren't the boss, you're the leader. So yes, you can tell people, do this. Why haven't you done this? Why haven't you done this yet? But that's that's not going to help them. You can criticize them when they fail, but that's not going to help them. What's going to help them is, is a supportive environment that allows them to, to explore different ideas and most importantly, approach you. So I talk about the wages thing again. Um, I'm pretty happy with the fact that at any point, if any of my employees feel underpaid, that they can approach me and say, hey, uh, what's going on here? Um, here's, how much, here's how much money I've earned for the company this month. I'm only getting paid this amount. Where's that money going? 
I think there's a lot of respect that comes both ways as a result of that. Uh, when we're sitting in the office together, the four of us, there isn't a feeling of hierarchy and there isn't a feeling of, I'm in charge, I'm going to tell you what to do. And sometimes there is, sometimes there has to be. Sometimes I have to say, yeah, sorry, could you, could you work on this today instead of the thing that you're more excited about? But for the most part, it, it doesn't feel like uh, a more kind of hierarchical environment because it's all imaginary anyway. It's all made up anyway. Um, yeah, and there are things you can do to approach that. Team is so important. Uh, the amount of money the company makes now and the amount of things we've been able to do over the last six months and reaching a point where, we, again, we can work on ProQuest full time wouldn't have been possible if I hadn't changed my mind about my management style or my frustrations. Thanks to that patience, learning that patience, just waiting and hearing people out, that's made a big difference. And uh, I'm sure there's a whole bunch of things I'm still yet to learn about management. Uh, but from my, my very limited year and a half, two years of experience, patience has been absolutely essential and making sure that people feel respected. Okay, so we're 31 minutes in right now. And I feel like I haven't spoken too much about any actual business advice. You see, I planned, I, pl I expected myself to go on some ramblings, which is why I, I, put, I put the word actual in bold, because I fully expected myself to ramble on about something only semi-related for a while. Okay, so. I know for a fact I haven't got a slide for this. If you are interested in starting a business, what you need to do is nothing until you make your first penny. Sorry, in terms of tax and business. A lot of people think the first step to starting a business is registering as a business. No, I, I disagree with that. Um, actually, I do talk about this. There you go. I talk about it right here. If you're a business second person or you're a business first person, you are adding value in some way to your industry or to your niche. Uh, whether that's selling something to a customer like a website or selling a product uh, on a platform like Steam, until you sell that product, you don't have a business. And legally speaking, you don't need to register as a business until you're, until you're starting to make money off of it. So my advice, and I think we spoke about this before, is the moment you make your first, to begin with, plan all you want, write business plans, whatever. But what's more crucial than planning and, and writing endless lists of the things that you're gonna do is actually doing things. I know so many people that I met at university who have had this amazing golden business plan, but never actually executed on it. There are clients I work for, uh, one of which right now is an app that I'm working on, and the person's design doc is phenomenally huge. It's around 20,000 words, which is bigger than my dissertation. And they've been working on that for six years. 2014 is when they started writing that document, when they came up with that idea. And in 2020, they've only just started doing it. How would that have looked if they'd have decided to just get in and do it? And that's not to say that planning isn't important. Planning is great, and it creates a great, brilliant, solid foundation for all of the work that you'll do. But I think to begin with, when you're at the starting stages, doing is more important than planning. Planning can come later, especially in your first year of business. Is this actually something you want to do? Well, you've just sunk 100, 200 hours into writing a business plan, and you start the work, and you realize, wow, I absolutely hate the thing that I'm currently doing. In terms of registering as a business, because, uh, sorry, I went on a ramble again then. on a uh, uh, It's got sidetracked again. In terms of starting a business, uh, when you make your first penny, book an appointment with an accountant. You'll be able to get a free appointment. And I'm sure every single year they have hundreds of meetings with young people who are interested in starting businesses. And any doubt in your mind will just go. Uh, I was very scared to see an accountant for most of my first year of business. Thankfully, I was already surrounded by people that already ran a business, so I knew mostly what I was doing. But when I spoke to that accountant, I realized, oh, there are a couple of things I've been doing wrong, and here's why. And the only reason I didn't go and see them in the first place was because for some reason I was afraid of seeing a person whose job it is to advise people on things like tax. Uh, the word business... You know, it's it's very, very simple. You create a cool thing, you sell that cool thing, you get money for selling that cool thing. Some of that goes to you. Some of it is just done by the business and is spent on equipment and, and employees. But there are so many things. And when you go on HMRC's website, it's designed to be confusing. I'm, I, I'm sure, I'm sure of it. I have no idea what's going on when I go on their website. But an accountant will handle all of that for you. And the first consultation, uh, most of the time will be free. 
And that will be an essential contact to you. In fact, your first business contact, real business contact. If I ever have a question to give you an example, we were recently working on a uh, an app that pays out to people. Uh, so customers subscribe to the app, they do a thing that someone else has posted, and then that person that posted the thing that the other person consumed or saw, um, they then get a payout at the end of the month. The tax implications of that are huge, and it's something that I worried about a lot, and I really needn't have done that because I sent one email off and the accountant gave me all the information I need, a list of questions to answer. See an accountant, go to an accountant. That's right, zoom in. Go to an accountant, right? Book an appointment with an accountant. Have a million questions prepared. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Have a million questions prepared. Not a million questions, but you will probably get an hour um, just a free time to chat with the accountant and make sure all of your all of everything you're asking, everything you need to know is uh, is settled and dealt with. Okay, back to the slideshow. Straight away, brilliant. Ah, communication. Uh, people are only difficult to work with if they're bad at communicating. You could be a rubbish developer. If you communicate properly, they'll never find out. They'll never know. They'll never know. Uh, and then the key to all of this is being honest. Here's what I mean. If someone approaches you and says, hey, could you build a website that does X, Y, and Z? And you go, I have no idea how to do that. Jeez. And they, they, they flash a budget in your face or, or you, you give a number to them and they say, yeah, that sounds great. And you're thinking, oh, that's brilliant. But I still have no idea what I'm doing. Don't do that. Because all you're going all you're gonna end up doing is winding yourself and ending, ending up in a lot of stress. You need to be honest with people. If someone says, can you build me a website that's X, Y, and Z? And you know how to do X and Y. You're the best at doing X and Y. But you've got no idea how to do Z. My advice is to say to that person, this all sounds great. X and Y are totally fine. But I'm not sure about Z. I don't have experience doing Z. And the result of that is they might, you might lose that client. They might go to someone else or the fee might reduce. But now you know, oh, there's a thing I need to learn. That's a thing I need to work on. And you haven't accepted a project that you're incapable of doing. Uh, and as a reminder for people that are doing a Bachelor of Computer Science, um, one of the requirements as a BCS holdup is to not lie about your abilities. Uh, so bear that in mind as well. It's not necessarily an ethical question. It's more a question of, do I want to allow myself in a huge amount of stress? Uh, there will be more clients. There will always be more work. And that follows along from that. Say no. If if a client is asking for too much, say, nope. I've only found this out in the last few months. It's, it's a cliched piece of advice, but it's something that a lot of people don't understand and a lot of people miss out on. Uh, it can land you into all sorts of trouble. If you just keep saying yes and yes and yes. What I'm saying is don't be like me this time last year. Well, I was getting messages on Christmas Eve and it ruined, killed a lot of Christmas for me. Um, this is actually two years ago because I'd taken on 12 projects at once over December because I didn't want to say no to someone because the higher the higher that, that dollar count went up on Fiverr of here's how much you're going to earn this month. I didn't earn very much that month at all. In fact, that was one of the months that I had to pay money to the company in order to pay out wages because I took on too much. And when you take on too much at once, everything else suffers as a result. So try and figure out what the amount is that you need for that month and say no to other clients or say, hey, we're booked up for the next month, for the next two months. Um, could you come back later? And that follows on from that. Uh, this again is, is a kind of cliched, um, uh, something that you'll see all over the place, but it's it's so true. Under promise, over deliver. If you buy a game and it lists out all of its features, and one of the features in that game, a huge thing, not maybe not a huge thing, but a small, small little touch that you really, really appreciate that wasn't listed on the Steam Store page and it improves the experience, you're not gonna be upset about that. You're gonna be twice as happy about that, right? Uh, an example in recent years is that I bought Minecraft in 2009. Now, Minecraft in 2009 wasn't even infinite. It was in dev, and then it moved to inf dev, and that's when they added infinite worlds. It didn't have biomes. Um, everything was super limited. The world generation was, was kind of bad. Every single time an update came out, as of any other game, it was like, oh my goodness, this is insane. Uh, and this relates to this by saying that, you know, I, I paid £11 for a game that was in the state it was currently in. 
it's a joy. It's a joy to receive more than you expect. And it will get you really, really high praise. And even on a platform like Fiverr, where even if someone says to you, I'll get you loads of work, it's a lie, it's, it's a scam. But even if someone says that to you, uh, there is still a great benefit to someone on your profile saying, uh, yeah, this is what they do. Um, a lot of my work, especially the work I've been doing over the last couple of months, um, some of the biggest projects we've, we've ever done uh, have been as a direct result of under-promising and over-delivering on other projects. Because, okay, let's say, you know, especially with, with, with things the way they are now, you're working remotely. Let's say you're doing work in Lincoln uh, and you contract someone, say, in London. Well, they're going to have loads of contacts around London and, and, and to other cities. And, and then your name starts spreading. And even if you aren't aware of it, they're discussing you in business meetings. I myself have said before, oh, this is a person who's really good at this thing. I got them to do this tiny little job and they did a really, really good job of it. I would highly recommend them. Uh, that's actually that that that's a real example. That person ended up getting a job as a direct result of me recommending them because they did a tiny little project. I think I paid them about forty pounds for for something else. So under promise, over deliver, and most importantly of all, have fun. Running a business is astoundingly rewarding. There is nothing else like it. I'm talking earlier about um, setting your own hours and saying, oh, it's not really like that, but. I'm, I'm in my second bedroom in my flat right now, having come home from the office at two o'clock because I can do that, because I, I can do that. I don't need to ask permission for that. Um, everyone got a raise this month, apart from me, but everyone got a raise this month and next month I'll be getting a raise as well. Isn't that wonderful? I didn't have to ask someone and say, hey, I think I've been doing a good job here. I know that the profits have been higher for the company. Let's get a raise. No, you can just say, everyone gets a raise. Email the accountant, get raise, done. Simple as that. There's a real sense of pride as well, when you build something or when you've created something and it's worth not just a lot in terms of money, but a lot in terms of contacts, in terms of experience and in terms of reputation. Uh, I it, There's no feeling quite like when I get an email from someone and they say, oh, this person recommended you. Um, I, wanna, I want this, this project done. Running a business is extremely fun. It offers more freedom than I think potentially any other job ever. Uh, and there are pitfalls to avoid, but you know, overall, although a lot of this has been this 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 talk has been, you know, here are things to avoid, here are mistakes that I made, or here are things you need to think about. Ultimately, it will be an extremely rewarding and satisfying experience if you do it right. Hugely stressful, phenomenally stressful, but also phenomenally rewarding and phenomenally freeing. Okay, so that brings us to the end. So I, I've I've been Thomas Locke. You can email me there uh, at Thomas Locke ninety seven on Twitter. My tweets are currently protected, but if you do drop me a follow, I'll probably accept you. Um, I also stream on on Twitch quite regularly. If you want to see me play Dead by Daylight, that's a video game. Uh, and my two companies, Fresh Play and Leuven, are on the screen there. If you want to check out Brawlquest, I would really be really really happy if if, if you're interested in it. Uh, unless you're in a Brawlquest shirt in that picture, um, head to duct.me forward slash bq. That'll take you through to the Steam page. Uh, and you can wishlist it on there. If you do have any questions or any concerns about business, then honestly, feel free to reach out to me at any time, and I'm happy to happy to answer any questions you might have. So yeah, thank you very much, and um, goodbye. Thank you.